Welcome to the Two Crazy Ketos podcast, where we help regular people like us make keto doable so it can become sustainable. We're your host, Joe. And Rachel. And we are the the Two two Crazy crazy Ketos. Ketos. The subject for today's podcast is a fun thing to talk about. It's something that a lot of people enjoy doing. But when it comes to keto, this is a very scary topic for a lot of people. In fact, it's so scary. A lot of people never get started on a ketogenic way of eating because they're afraid of this. And even more people, once they have gotten this started, decide, I can't do this anymore. And they either quit or put their keto lifestyle on pause because of today's topic. Oh, absolutely, Joe. In fact, I believe that there's somebody out there right now who wants to start keto but they are so afraid of this topic that they are willing to wait until next year to start keto. Now, I know everyone's thinking right now, considering it is September, everyone's probably thinking, oh, you're talking about holiday parties. The holidays are coming. We need to learn how do you do keto on the holidays? We have another topic for that one later on. That's going to be a future podcast. Before we tell you what we're talking about today, we want to invite you, if you are brand new, We upload new podcasts every Tuesday and Friday, so please head on down below and hit that subscribe or follow button so that you're notified every time we upload a new podcast. Are you ready to tell them what we're talking about? Tell them, Joe. Today, we're going to be talking about eating out at restaurants on the ketogenic diet. Somebody just felt goosebumps go up and down their arms because the prospect of going out to eat on keto is truly frightening. If you got started on keto in your kitchen, in your home, in the safety of isolation, you've purged your pantry, you've been eating delicious meat and eggs and you know maybe some cheese, maybe a little bit of cruciferous vegetables, but you got this thing figured out. You've got your day planned and you have this, you know, routine that you're in. And when you have the prospect of going out to eat in front of you, it can be super scary. I know we're always on the Facebook groups in our mighty network. We get a lot of emails. People are all the time going, you can't do keto if you want to go out to restaurants. When you go out to restaurants, you have to go off plan because it's not possible. Right now, we're in the middle of beef, butter, bacon, and egg, and and we're seeing people go, well, you know, okay, great. Keto is fine at home. Beef, butter, bacon, egg is fine at home. Carnivore is fine at home. But if you're a truck driver, if you are a business traveler, you, you know, you can't do it. There's too many times you have to go out to restaurants and you can't stick to strict keto when you have to go out to restaurants. And unfortunately, a lot of people are saying no to invitations when they would really like to have some community. They would like to have some face-to-face interaction with their family, with their friends, but because they are so afraid of this issue, they're actually saying, "Um, no, I have other plans. I can't make it this time because they're truly afraid to get together. And we're here to tell you it is absolutely possible to eat out at restaurants on a ketogenic carnivore way of eating. Not only is it possible to eat out, it's possible to eat out and stick to your diet and have a good time. And we're going to talk about that today. And we want to start off by saying, listen, this is just going to be different. It's not awful to go out to eat on a keto way of eating. It's just going to be a new way of going out to eat. Yeah, we don't want anybody to be living out their lives in a climate of fear. Fear and reaction and heightened emotion is just not what you want to live in. You don't want to live in that climate. So I want us to have a really calm discussion about going out to eat because it's not going to be awful. Just like you said, it's not awful. It's just new. If we approached every new thing like it was going to be terrible, we would never have a cell phone. We would (sighs) never have a new television set because there's new. It's new to us. There's going to be a little bit of a learning curve and that is okay. We are up to the task of learning new things. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty, and I mean all of the different steps that we need to take to be successful when we go out to eat on a ketogenic way of eating, 
we need to go back. I mean, we need to go way back. We need to go back to before we even thought about going on a keto diet. As a matter of fact, we need to go back to a time before we even contemplated going on any type of a weight loss routine. And we need to take a look at the restaurants that we were going to. We need to take a look at what kind of emotions we felt when we were going to those restaurants. Why were we going to them? What type of restaurants were we going to? And what were the experiences and the emotions that we were feeling around those times that we went? Absolutely. We need to go back and we need to close that chapter of our lives. We need to do that in order to start a new chapter. I had to close the chapter that I previously had with the grocery store, for instance, because I had a bad relationship at the grocery store. I made a lot of wrong choices at the grocery store. And so I need to start shopping for my keto food at the grocery store. So I need to make peace and close the chapter where Rachel purchased a lot of sugary treats at the grocery store and start a new chapter where Rachel can make good decisions at the grocery store. And it's the same thing for restaurants, whether it is fast food, fast casual, even sit down, fine dining establishments. We need to take a look at where did our relationship with these restaurants take us. And we're going to be super vulnerable today. We're going to be really honest about our horrible relationship that we had with restaurants prior to keto. And we've talked about before, like our relationship with food was bad, but our relationship with restaurants, it was even worse. You know, our entire dating and marriage revolved around where are we going to go out to eat? How much is it going to cost? What can we eat? How much can we eat? It caused lots of fights. And the bottom line is it just, it was ugly. It was terrible. It was very embarrassing. And I want to say that we're not trying to glorify how bad we were. I don't think that that is very helpful, but I think it's important that we talk about where we were at because somebody out there thinks you don't know how bad it can get. You don't know me. And we do know you. We do get it. We were at this point where restaurants were the source of all of our celebration. It was the only thing that we could do together as a couple. And we really overindulged in terrible food. And we did it for years. And honestly, my relationship with restaurants began before I met Joe, way before I met Joe. I saw restaurants and especially the drive through of a McDonald's or a Burger King as personal freedom. That is how I measured my freedom as a young woman who now has her own job and her own money and I'm breaking away from my parents, and this is what freedom looks like. I wish that I saw freedom as a backpacking trip through Europe, you know, something to do, an adventure. But I saw freedom in the form of, I'd like a number two supersized with a Diet Coke. That's, that was freedom to me, that I had the freedom to order, and I was really good at it. And this is an important step. And I know a lot of you are thinking right now, like, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to dive into our horrible history at restaurants? Because it's a healing thing. And as we go through this, it's going to help you to recognize where you don't need to get tripped up when we do this on a ketogenic way of eating. So let's take some examples from us. We've talked a little bit about some of our restaurant experiences, but we looked at places like CC's where we would take the kids and go like, hey, we can get the entire family to eat here for less than $20. Kids, eat up. Nobody go home until you've had like five pies of pizza. Uh, we would find restaurants that had the lowest quality food, but where you could get the most of it. Because we weren't looking at nutrients back then. We were looking at volume. And it was not a good way to look at restaurants. Then you had to look at our restaurants that really became like a fun place for us. And the one for me that is a real standout, and it's really important that we talk about this particular restaurant, is Outback Steakhouse. Because Outback Steakhouse for me represents every bad decision that I ever made 
with going out to eat prior to keto. And here's what I'm talking about. In my entire adult life, of all of the times that I've ever gone to Outback Steakhouse, even before meeting you, I have never, ever, ever had a steak at Outback Steakhouse. That completely blows my mind because, yeah, I mean, Outback Steakhouse has perfectly keto-friendly options. But you were, for me. you were never utilizing any of those. What were you eating instead of steak? This is really embarrassing, but I'm going to say this because I know that this is going to help people because it's really going to help people recognize some issues that they could have and, and where they need to go. When I went to Outback Steakhouse, the only meat that I've ever had at Outback Steakhouse was their ribs, double sauced. So that was number one. So we had ribs with double sauce. Here was my typical go into Outback Steakhouse. We go into Outback Steakhouse. The waiter comes in and, and I'm like, I want three loaves of bread, two for me, one for everybody else sitting at the table. That That's number one. Then generally, even though I'm an adult and I was an adult when I was doing this, I would usually get like ribs or a half a rack of ribs or I would get the kids macaroni and cheese because it was really good. And I'm not trying to trigger anybody here, but I, I want people to understand where I'm coming from. So I would have the macaroni and cheese. Then I would get appetizers. They had some kind of soup, if I remember right. It's been years since we've been there, but I remember they had some kind of soup that was pretty good. So a lot of times I would get that. And then I would just eat all the appetizers, usually a blooming onion for myself and maybe like the fries that were smothered in cheese and bacon. So at least I was eating cheese and bacon, right? Um, But of course I was combining it with fries. And then I would, of course, finish it off with a dessert, which was the chocolate thunder from down under. And that's what I ate every time I went to Outback Steakhouse. But it got really embarrassing after a while. So we started ordering it to go and would eat it at home. Oh, absolutely. And that kind of took me back to those days in the drive-thru. I never ate McDonald's food inside of McDonald's. I was so embarrassed by my personal order that I wanted to have as little contact with the person as possible. You know, to shop at McDonald's, I always had cash ready. I did not want to even wait for a credit card to go through. And I can remember when we would eat massive amounts of food at CeCe's, I would send the kids up, like, go get me some more of this pizza because I knew I was going to be met with uh, judgmental faces because I would just be back up at the buffet counter and how many times is too many times as far as what I was concerned about. And so, yes, when you suggested, hey, I think we need to take this Outback Steakhouse celebration home, I couldn't be happier because that meant that I didn't have to deal with a waiter. I didn't have to look at somebody cleaning a table across from us that may look at our plates and be like, oh my goodness, they're ordering so much food. It doesn't even fit on the table properly. And there's another place that uh, had a really bad history with, and that is the Mexican restaurant, right? Because what did we do when we went to the Mexican restaurant? We just ate a ton of chips and salsa, and we would order a giant platter, really the biggest thing that we could find, and plan on taking it home and eating it. Because we had eaten so much chips and salsa, you were almost embarrassed to have the waitress or waiter come back to the table because We just kept asking them, you know, two baskets, three baskets, four baskets. And we were just filling up on that. And then when the the food came, I was too embarrassed to keep eating there. I know a lot of people are asking right now, why are you guys talking about gorging yourselves at restaurants prior to keto? What does this have to do with eating out on a ketogenic way of eating? It has a lot to do with it. As a matter of fact, it's the first step in how to be successful when you want to go out to eat on keto because step number one is we need to identify trigger places we need to identify restaurants that we went to prior to keto prior to ever even contemplating a diet and figure out places that we have a history with and either a learn how to overcome that or b just avoid them so for me there are so many steakhouses out there i have no reason to ever ever go to Outback Steakhouse because I just sabotage myself in so many ways there that even though they have a good steak, all I see is the 12 items that I used to eat every time I went there. 
So I just choose to find a different steakhouse now. I think that that was a great way that you close that chapter of your life, deciding that I don't have to go back to a place that's going to make me feel guilty for my past is a great way to handle it. I mean, yes, there are plenty of other steakhouses out there. Another way that you might want to close a chapter that you have with a restaurant is the way that I've closed my chapter with McDonald's, and that is I rarely use the drive through anymore. It was in the drive through that I made a lot of sneak eating choices, that I felt very guilty, that I was afraid to make eye contact with people. Now I go into McDonald's. If we are on the road and need to utilize a McDonald's, maybe we need a quick egg or a quick patty of some sort, I can go into McDonald's and I can make eye contact with that cashier and I can order responsibly. And that was part of me saying, Rachel, I forgive you and I trust you and moving forward, you can shop at this particular restaurant and make good choices. But either way, whether you decide that you're going to keep eating at a restaurant, but you're going to you know, eat differently, or you are going to avoid a restaurant altogether, It's very important for you to first and foremost close that past chapter that you had with a restaurant. Now comes the fun part. We're going to get into step two and we're going to figure out where can we go out to eat on keto. And this is the part that Rachel excels at. She gets so excited whenever we go to a new area and I say, hey, you need to find some places we can eat because she is an organizational freak. She loves to journal and make plans. Well, here's the thing. I used to feel so out of control when it came to restaurants. And now I take a lot of pleasure in feeling in control. Because if I just plan a little bit, I can really choose a restaurant confidently and be walking into an experience with my head held high. Now, the reason we're going to do this exercise right here is When someone invites you out to eat, you want to have a ready-to-go list of places that you feel confident when you go to eat there. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically make an upside-down funnel. We're going to start off wide, and then we're going to narrow it down to five or six local places. They can even be chain restaurants. So if you're a traveler, you know I can look for this place, this place, this place, and this place. So we're going to start off with what cuisines do you like that you find are easy to make keto. Now, for example, two cuisines that I like are Mexican and Italian, but for me, I find them difficult to make keto because the sides are pretty not keto friendly. You know, you can, yes, go in there and get fajitas, but pretty much every Mexican restaurant is going to give me rice and beans and tortillas, and I can't eat any of that. So I'm going to feel gypped. So that is not going to be in my list of cuisines. I'm going to have up there, you know, different meat places and things like that. From there, we're going to narrow down into more generic restaurants. Yeah. So you may want to start out and just think, okay, barbecue. That's going to be very keto friendly. What's another one, Joe? Uh, burger joints. I would say any place that serves breakfast food is usually pretty good, like a diner. Yeah, and you got steak houses. What about a wings place? Yeah, all of those different places are going to be really good because you know that you can really make those things keto. But from there, we can narrow it down even more and we can start finding specific restaurants based on what we like. For example, when it comes to barbecue, I like to find barbecue places that sell meat by the pound because once again, I won't feel gypped because they're trying to give me a bunch of sides. You buy the meat by the pound and I don't have to worry about the sides. I'm not paying for them, so I don't care if I'm not eating them. I'm going to look for a diner because I know that every town has one, right? That's something that I can be confident in. Usually there's a diner someplace. My my dad was a big fan of diners, so... I like to have diners because I know that they sell a lot of breakfast items a la carte. Now, of course, I'm always going to say, please use real eggs because sometimes there's some wonkiness in scrambled eggs, but I might order a fried egg. I know I can order several sides of bacon. I can find a hamburger patty. Diners are used to accommodating people, you know, who want a la carte items. So I really like going to a diner. Then we get into like burger and steakhouses, and this is a complete opposite of where we were pre-keto. Pre-keto, 
we always wanted to look at our plate and see how much food are we getting. Now, when I look for a local burger place or a local steakhouse, I look for places that sell it a la carte. Why? Comes back to the whole idea of I don't want to pay for food that I'm not going to be able to eat. So, for example, we have a local burger place here called Tucker Dukes. And when you go to Tucker Dukes, everything is a la carte. So I can go there with my boys and they're all going to get whatever they want. And they have to pay for their tater tots or whatever side they're getting and their burger. And me, I get my burger. I spend half as much as them and I don't feel gypped. The same thing with the steaks. And if I can't find those kind of places or maybe the steakhouse is like a ridiculously expensive $100 a steak place, I start looking for chain restaurants like a Texas Roadhouse or something where I know we can make good substitutions. Now, one thing when you talk about price, it's important to say that, yes, in the past, our decision making as far as a restaurant was, um, it had to do with how much food, how much volume of food I could get for my money. I was never looking at quality. I don't think anybody goes into CeCe's Pizza and they're thinking like, man, I really want the top shelf pizza. Like this is a pizza that, you know, a Chicago or a New York pizzeria would really celebrate, right? No, I was looking for cheap and a lot of food. And so now I don't go out to eat nearly as much. So we used to go out to eat maybe once or twice a week. Now I'm going out once or twice a month. So now I have a little bit more of a budget so that when I do go out to eat, I can expect better quality. I can go to a burger place where they're not just giving me a burger in a wrapper, but they are giving me a burger on a plate and I'm going to sit down and enjoy it. Now that we've done that, we're going to move on to step three because we've identified what are the places that we most likely would want to go out to eat. Like, And again, going back to that list, like for me, there's never a fish restaurant on there. I don't like fish, so I'm not going to even look for a fish place unless I'm going with a whole group of people and then hopefully I can find like maybe shrimp or a burger or something. But now we're going to go into step number three and we're going to comprise a list of local places, places in your immediate area, because that's where we're most likely going to be going, as well as a list of chain restaurants if we happen to travel a lot. And we're going to look for foods that we like and a variety of types. And we're going to literally write down a whole list of restaurants that are our go-to restaurants. And right here, Yelp is your very best friend because I guarantee you There are restaurants in your area that would be great for you to frequent, but you have no idea that they're there. We certainly did not have, you know, a big guidebook for restaurants in our local area. And it has only been through the help of Google and Yelp that we've even discovered that there are local barbecue joints, local steakhouses, you know, some mom and pop diners that are excellent. We just didn't know that they even existed. So if you could go onto Yelp, you go onto Google and you start looking up local menus. That is a great place to get started because you can quickly scan this place and see, is this in a budget that I really like? What kind of variety of food does they do they have? This is a great place to start. And since you bring those subjects up, let's talk about that. When we make our list, we want to have a lot of things on there and we want to divide our list up even further and have a list for, hey, these are the upper class restaurants. If somebody says, let's go out to eat, these are like the, you know, the chainish kind of Texas Roadhouse, Chili, those kind of places. Then we're going to have another list of fast food places. Because you never know. You also want to divide it down to expense. These are the places that, hey, it's going to cost me $20, $30, and then this is a place that may cost me $40 or $50. Maybe it's like an anniversary dinner or something like that. And now that you've done that, you've got a good place to go on. And since we're talking about this, let's go over some of our lists. Like what are our list places when someone says, hey, where do you want to go out to eat? What what is your number one go-to for going out to eat? I usually think boom buffalo wall wings. I know that I can eat wings and I know that most people like wings and they also have burgers and things there, but I know I'm going to get good quality chicken wings. They fry them in beef tallow, so I'm not worried about the oils even. So I can confidently say, hey, Buffalo Wild Wings, is that good for you? Yeah. And as a matter of fact, Buffalo Wild Wings is a restaurant we actually did a video and have a blog post on 
because we went in there and literally broke down what can you eat here and a little secret, we did that for ourselves so that we now had a permanent list of this is how many carbs are in this spice, this is how many carbs are in this spice, hey, this is something that we should probably avoid and that is a great place for it to go. So when someone says, hey, I want to go to Wings, the first thing we do is, is there a Buffalo Wild Wings in the area? Then our other go-to place is Texas Roadhouse because Texas Roadhouse has prime rib and we have talked to them and they pretty much will always make accommodations for us. And then another one for us is Brazilian barbecues because we can go in there once again and we can get a little bit better quality meat, a little bit higher level than going to like, for example, a Texas Roadhouse. But we can have as much as we want and we can also limit it to just meat. So now I go in, I don't feel bad paying $50 because I'm going to fill up on meat as opposed to going into another restaurant and paying maybe $20, $30, $40 for that restaurant but I can't eat half of whatever's on my plate. And also, little secret, if you do like Brazilian restaurants and those kind of places, lunch is usually about half price. Another inexpensive option for us is Chipotle because we can get like meat and vegetables on top of salad and it's no big deal. And a lot of people know Chipotle and they can order for themselves. It's not weird and it's very local. Now we do have a little issue here. We've made a list of all of these different local restaurants or chain restaurants that we can go to when we're traveling. And it's awesome. We have a great list of different places we can go to with friends, family members, coworkers, whatever it may be. But what we're not taking into account is there may be times where we are invited to go out to eat and we don't get to pick the restaurant. And before we get into that, I do want to say, if you have a friend and they call you or maybe a business and they say, is there anything you don't want? Don't feel bad to tell them, hey, anything but this. And like we talked about before, for me, if people ask me, where would you like to go out to eat? I always say, I'm pretty open so long as it's not Mexican or Italian. And after that, they've got a whole list, but I don't have to pick the place. But now they may pick a place that's not on your current list. So what do we do now? Here is where Google is your friend. Yelp is your friend. Once again, you are going to go to the restaurant website or you are going to go to Yelp and look up the restaurant menu. And when you do, I want you to find the most keto-friendly option that you see there. Then when you have an option in mind, I want you to call the restaurant. You're going to call the restaurant and you're going to tell them, hey, I am keto. I want to have as little carbs as possible and I am going to be coming to your restaurant and I want to be able to order confidently. And let me tell you, restaurants want your business. They want to work with you, especially after we've gotten through the years 2020 and 2021, okay? Restaurants are recovering from lost sales. So they want to meet your needs. Just be willing to have a conversation with the person on the other end of that restaurant phone and ask them, what can you do to help me order confidently? So once we've done that, we're now gonna go to the restaurant. And this is where we can maybe start freaking out a little bit, but that's okay. We're going to get through this because we're going to go to the restaurant. And when we go to order, we're again, we're going to look at the menu. Hopefully we've had a chance to see ahead of time as Rachel was discussing what we can sub out for, but maybe we didn't get all of the answer. Maybe there's something on the menu that you didn't see when you're online. Don't be afraid to ask for substitutions. We have gone into Texas Roadhouse and literally, thanks to our friend Chris Bear, asked the waiter, hey, can you give us a set of cheese fries, but hold the fries? And they give us funny looks. You're like, can you explain that? I'm like, here's what I want you to do. I want you to lay bacon down on a plate and then cover it with cheese and bacon bits and sour cream. And they're like, oh, we can do that. I mean, one of our favorite things to do when we go into Texas Roadhouse, we, it comes with a side for our, we always get in a 16 ounce prime rib. So we want a side. So what our side is always the same thing. It is, I would like an order of broccoli, put it on a plate, and everything that you would put on a loaded baked potato, I want that on my broccoli. I want you to put butter and sour cream and cheese and bacon bits, and I want you to make me a loaded baked potato, but with broccoli. 
and they always do it for us. We've been to, I can't even tell you how many Texas Roadhouse. It's not on their menu, but they're willing to sub out. So we ask for subs. Now, I do want to say, when you ask for substitutions, be prepared to pay a little bit of extra money, especially if it's like, hey, I want this fresh vegetable over potato chips or something like that. So you have to be willing to do that. The other thing we need to do, and and this is one that makes little people nervous, is we need to be okay with telling the restaurant staff that we have a sensitivity, an intolerance, or an allergy. This may be something that is challenging for a lot of people. I certainly began cringing when Joe would bring up the topic of intolerance, sensitivity, or an allergy to food. But remember, you're going into this restaurant as a paying customer. You're going to be using kind words patient language, and you're just asking for help. And this is a wait staff that wants to help you. Oh, the restaurant wants your business. So when you help them serve you better, you're going to come back to their restaurant and be a repeat customer, which is exactly what they desire to have. And then you're going to help them with ideas for their menu. Because there's going to be another person that's keto that they're going to come in contact with, hopefully, right? Because we're trying to change the world one ribeye at a time. So you're not going to be the only keto customer that they ever have in their life. And they're going to be able to make recommendations to future customers because of this interaction that you're willing to have now. It's funny you say that because there have been a lot of restaurants we went in and and just based on our ordering – The wait staff would go, are you keto? Are you carnivore? Are you low carb? And that to me speaks volumes that, you know, this way of eating is getting out there more. And I know that this is a touchy subject for some people. Some people just do not want to go into a restaurant and say, hey, I have a sensitivity or an intolerance or an allergy to something when they haven't been medically diagnosed with it. Now, I am going to say this. As far as I'm concerned, I do have a sensitivity and intolerance or an allergy to a lot of these foods. If you give me some of these different foods, I'm going to go home and probably poop my pants on the way there, right? The bottom line is if you give me something with a whole bunch of canola oil, I probably won't make it through the meal. So I do have a sensitivity or an allergy to these things. But what you want to do is just lovingly have a conversation with your wait staff. You don't want to go in there and slam your fist on the table and go, I have an allergy and you need to do this right for me. That's not how we're going to handle this. We're going to go into the restaurant and we're going to lovingly say, hey, listen, can you do me a favor? I have an intolerance. I have whatever word you want to use, intolerance, sensitivity, allergy to these foods. Can you please do your best to make sure it doesn't get on my plate? A great example for me is diet soda. I like to treat myself to a Coke Zero or Diet Coke when I go out to a restaurant. But I always lovingly say to the wait staff, again, lovingly say to the wait staff, hey, I have an issue with sugar. Can you please double check that you don't accidentally put the Coke inside of my glass instead of a Diet Coke? And they are always like, no problem. And there have even been times where the Coke has come back or the Diet Coke rather has come back to the table. I'm like, ooh, this tastes a little sweet. And I would say, hey, are you sure that this is a Diet Coke? And they're like, I am sure. And almost every single time they've said, you know what? I'm sure, but let me go get you a new one just in case I made a mistake. But it's all in how you communicate with that wait staff. And I don't think that it's inauthentic to say that you have a sensitivity or an intolerance. Honestly, like you're saying, you're going to feel it. If you don't speak up and you've been keto for a while and you go home and you have put yourself in the path of gluten or you've put yourself in the path of sugar. Bathroom pyrotechnics, baby. Absolutely. You are going to have some digestive issues and you may feel terrible in your joints. Well, now you're really looking at having a bad interaction with a restaurant. You don't want to feel like that. You don't want to pay for your restaurant experience two, three, four days after you've eaten there. And here's the thing. If you follow all these steps, if you identify the places, you call them ahead of time, when you get to the restaurant, you lovingly take care of your wait staff, you lovingly talk to them, and make sure you tip your wait staff, especially if they're accommodating you like this, because they're going to remember it. You're going to have a great place that you can go to over and over again. And I'm going to give you a great example. We've talked about this on our YouTube channel, on our live streams. 
whenever we go to Orlando, there is only one place that we go out to eat now. When we go up there, we go to the Texas de Brazil on International Drive. Why? Because they accommodate us. We go in there. We we actually had two meetups with subscribers in there. I called them up. I explained to them, hey, we have a whole bunch of people. We all eat keto. Can you do me a favor? Make sure that there's no bread or potatoes or anything like that that comes onto the table. If somebody gets it at the bar, that you know, we don't judge anybody. There's no keto police in our community, but we're not going to set you up for failure and place it on the table. He said, no problem. Last time Rachel and I went up there just with us and our kids, we sat down, the waitress comes over and she goes, okay, so let me understand, you have a gluten and a wheat allergy, right? And I'm like, huh, what are you talking about? And she's like, oh, no, 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 the manager's got that in here because you're registered under your name and your phone number and he has it in here. When you come here, Please make sure that they don't ever get any carbohydrates, bread, or gluten on the table. We were so impressed with that, but I don't think that that is an isolated case. I think that there are a lot of restaurateurs out there that are trying to do better. They're trying to provide the most excellent experience that they can so far as they can provide, right? Because they want your repeat business. And guess what? When we found out that they were taking care of it that way when they were notating that in our file, in our restaurant file, man, we will never not go there when we go to Orlando because they have earned our business and they will keep our business. Now, we've given you a lot of good tips on how to be successful going out to eat at a restaurant on the ketogenic lifestyle. But before we end the podcast, we want to leave you with two really important points and tips. Number one, you need to eat at home as much as possible because you are more in control. Oh, absolutely. First of all, you're in control of your wallet in a different way. I love going out to eat, but it costs a lot of money. So staying at home really saves us a tremendous amount of money and allows us to put more money into our ribeye budget at home. But in addition to money, you can't control all of the ingredients at a restaurant like you can at home. I think about us using Redmond seasoning salt and Redmond salt and garlic salt and lemon pepper and all of the things that we use to cook with. I can control my seasoning blends, my sauces at home, but I don't have as much control when I go to a restaurant. Yeah, think about natural flavors. A lot of people on keto avoid natural flavors because we don't know what is inside of the natural flavors. Well, it's the same thing at a restaurant. We don't know all of the cooking practices. Like a lot of people do not know that IHOP has pancake batter inside of their eggs. You just don't know all of that stuff. But that's going to lead us to our last point before we end this podcast. And that is one of my favorite sayings. We want to strive for perfection, but no, we are never going to achieve it. 90% is good enough. Now, let's get this clear. 90% is good enough doesn't mean go to Texas Roadhouse because you eat well at home and I can have the rolls that they're putting on my table. It doesn't mean I can go and have a chocolate thunder from down under when I go to Outback Steakhouse. It means when I'm at home, I'm eating as good as possible. I'm making sure that my seasonings don't have maltodextrin in them. I'm making sure that I'm cooking with good healthy fats instead of seed oils. But when we go out to eat, you don't have that much control. So don't worry about it as much. You want to do the best you can. But if you're not having seed oils when you're at home having a salad and you go out to a restaurant and they give you, for example, maybe a ranch dressing or a blue cheese dressing, don't worry about it so much if it's made with a bad seed oil because overall in your health that is not going to have a significant impact because that is going to fall into that 10% of don't worry about it. And I'm going to give you a perfect example before we leave. As we were getting ready for this podcast, Rachel and I thought it would be fun to head on over to the Texas Roadhouse website and then go down to the bottom to the nutrition page. And if you didn't know, most of these restaurants have a nutrition page somewhere on their website so you can look up allergies, you can look up you know how many carbs are in food. So that is a great tip as you're going through your list. But we thought it would be fun to go to their website and plug in what we normally purchase when we go to Texas Roadhouse because it is one of the restaurants that is on our list for whenever we're asked, where do you want to go? We choose Texas Roadhouse. And I don't know if it was fun because when we plugged in, hey, we're looking for the gluten-free options, we absolutely thought we're going to find the prime rib that we always order. But 
the prime rib didn't show up. So obviously, first and foremost, they're using some wheat in the uh, seasoning blend that they're using for this prime rib. So first of all, that was super, super shocking. The next thing, once we located the prime rib on the menu, we also found it's got four total carbs in it. Yeah, which is probably coming from the seasoning. The other interesting thing was if you put in that you have a soy and a wheat allergy, it eliminated all of the steaks. All of the steaks were gone if you put in you had a soy and a wheat allergy. We then went on and plugged in the red. We didn't do the broccoli because obviously broccoli with like as a loaded potato isn't on the menu. It's a custom thing. But we did put in what we get with our steak, which is the creamy horseradish sauce, which if I remember right was like three or four carbs for a cup. And we usually each have two or three of those cups each. And then we also like to get the cheese on top as well as mushrooms and onions. Well, guess what? When we were done... This perfectly keto steak, not even including the broccoli with cheese, bacon, and sour cream, this perfectly keto steak has about 20 carbs the way we order it. Does that mean that we are never going back to Texas Roadhouse? No, it means we're still going to continue to go to Texas Roadhouse, and we're still going to continue to order probably close to what we're doing. Maybe maybe forego the onions every once in a while because the onions are bringing eight carbs, but they are delicious. Um, but here's what we look at. It's a it's a treat for us. But again, we're coming down to 90% is good enough. Are we going to eat a steak like that at home with a creamy horseradish sauce that's probably made with bad oils and uh, probably some maltodextrin or some kind of sugar inside of the seasoning? No. But we go out to Texas Roadhouse maybe once a month. So 90% is good enough. And at the end of the day, you want to think about why you're going to a restaurant. Either you are going to meet with some work colleagues and celebrate your workplace. Maybe you're going to go out with family or friends and you're going to have good conversations. Maybe you're going out on a date night with your partner. These are important things for us to do. And sometimes it's nice to get away from the house. We don't have to be afraid of going out. We just need to provide some planning, be prepared And I think that that's going to be a good way that we can stride confidently into a restaurant. So hopefully these tips helped you out and hopefully this makes it easy for you when you go out to restaurants to not have that fear. Our real prayer is that having these different tips will help people not go off course Maybe, you know, find their way where all of a sudden they're like, hey, I can't do keto because I travel too much or I can't do keto because the holidays are coming up. It's too difficult to go out with family because if you utilize these tips, you can still go out and enjoy yourself, have a good time and feel confident that you're going to stick to your keto journey. And that's where we're going to end this podcast. And I do want to invite you once again, if you are brand new, make sure you head down below and hit that subscribe or follow button since we do upload new podcasts every Tuesday and Friday. And I'm Joe. And I'm Rachel. And we are the The Two Two Crazy Crazy Ketos. Ketos.